<laughs> That's so funny. My name is Krista Franklin. I am from Dayton, Ohio, but I've lived in Chicago for 16 years. I'm a visual artist and I'm also a writer. I came to Chicago on a whim. <laughs> I had a bed. My best friend lived here and um, she had moved here to go to SAIC in the writing department in graduate school, strangely enough. And uh, we were supposed to come together to get our master's um, in writing from this institution. And she applied. I did not. She got in. She came here. Uh, Fola Day Speaks is her name. A year after she had already been in the program, her roommate was moving to New York and contacted me, asked me if I wanted to move to Chicago and be her roommate here. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, why would I just move to Chicago? <laughs> that seems crazy. And uh, the next day I called them back and I said yes. As soon as I got here I met some really amazing poets. They immediately kind of mainlined me into the poetic culture, the writing culture here in this city, which was vibrant then and, and just continues to be thriving. And so what made me stay was that they embraced me as a community member, as a family member, and really nurtured me, um, not just as a writer, but also as a visual artist. I continue to find community. You know, wherever it is that I kind of go for any length of time, my family just continues to expand, you know? I believe in collectives. I believe in creative and artistic families. I believe in communities of artists and writers who are behind one another supporting each other and helping each other to improve your work. My my artistic family, they'll bring me food when I don't have grocery money. They come by to help me clear my house out when I need to, you know, purge stuff. Yeah, creative community, artistic community is very vital to the well-being of any artist, of any writer. We can seek out and find our communities by being in areas where we love to be. If you know that you love spoken word poetry, then you're going to go to open mics where they do spoken word poetry, right? And then you're going to begin to meet people who you're like, ooh, their work is dope. Like, I want to get to know them. And you kind of start to reach out to these people, doing artist residencies and doing internships and things of that nature, being of service to other, other communities that you think are important, be active in your local sphere, to do the things that you believe in, you know? To be around people who do the things that you care about and that you value. There's definitely been periods of time in my life when I would, where I would have identified myself more as a visual artist than I would have a writer, but that more had to do with what I was producing and the frequency with which I was producing it. So, you know, if I, would, if I hadn't written a poem in like six or seven months, then I, I wouldn't feel comfortable being like, I'm a writer, even though, you know, that, that may or may not be true, you know? But I would say that right now, it's about equal. I think I would consider myself to be more of an aesthetic artist than a conceptual artist. I mean, I definitely have concepts that I'm working through, typically around black futurity, lives of women of color, the surreal. You know, there's some concepts that I'm constantly kind of working through, but I'm definitely interested in the aesthetic. Over the past six to seven months, I've really moved back toward writing. My studio practice might consist of me sitting on the floor composing a collage. It might consist of me laying in my bed writing a poem. It might consist of me doing a great deal of research and reading. It really varies. I mean, I could be, I could be sitting in my bed doing watercolors. It's just whatever I feel I need to be focusing my energy on at any given time, is what gets my attention. I don't necessarily gravitate towards one specific medium. If I do, I would say collage. The concept dictates the medium. If it feels like it would be better as a print, then that's what I do. If it feels like the idea would be better executed as a collage, then that's what I do. If I feel like I have something that would be best articulated in writing, in words, in vocabulary, then that's what I do. To be able to say that I'm a working artist, coming from you know, the particular working middle class background that I came from, from people who you know, were artistic people in their own right but never were able to be artists professionally, I think is significant, you know? So I'm not sure if I have like one specific series or work of art 
that I consider to be like the pinnacle. I don't know about my eureka moment. I'm not sure when the eureka moment's going to come. Or if I've had a bunch of eureka moments, you know, as, as a series of moments. I'm working on a book right now that I think has um, great potential, you know, to have something produced probably by the end of 2018. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, we'll see how that goes. I do feel good about having exhibited at the Studio Museum in Harlem, you know, this year and had some work in an exhibition there called Excerpt. Something that I think is you know, important to me personally um, to be exhibiting in institutions that have been around for a while, that are institutions of color. I do feel that I am responsible as a woman of color to tell the stories that are significant to the experiences of people of color. That is my heart and soul, that is my purpose, I feel like, for being on the planet, is to continue to illuminate the nuances and the subtleties of what those experiences may be. To cultivate um, and to support other women and other people of color to do that. You know, to feel empowered to tell the stories that are significant and that are meaningful and that have never been told or never been told in a particular kind of way. Um, about what it means to be a person of color in the world. I think there's room for, for artists of color to define for themselves what their stories are and what are the stories that are important for them to tell. What's the art that's important for them to make? Tell the stories you want to tell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's all from a really deep human experience and you know whether it's culturally centered you know, or not is neither here nor there. I am constantly coming into contact with different artists I'm being exposed to all the time, you know, whether they be living or whether they be dead, who are inspiring to me. Their stories, the way that they produce their work, continues to kind of be this well for ideas, a well for how to, how to be an artist in the world. Some of the stalwart figures who continue to surface in my consciousness, Frida Kahlo, Romina Bearden. I have a very soft spot in my heart for Jean-Michel Basquiat. I have a very soft spot in my heart for um, Andy Warhol. Lucille Clifton is very important to me. I think Gwendolyn Brooks is an absolute master. Lorraine Hansberry comes to mind. James Baldwin. Malcolm X was a writer and a very incredible intellectual. I feel like William Burroughs, I think, is ridiculous. Allen Ginsberg, I have a special place in my heart for him. And there's just so many you know, really masterful and amazing makers and thinkers, intellectuals and writers who influenced and continue to influence the way that I think about the world, the way that I think about teaching, the way that I think about being an artist, the way I think about being a human. Music figures really prominently in my work as well. I think about music constantly, all the time. Some of my favorite musicians, Marvin Gaye, Chuck D from Public Enemy, Public Enemy, Right now I'm listening a lot to an artist named Nick Hakeem, Curtis Mayfield, Jimi Hendrix, Steely Dan, Fleetwood Mac, ACDC, <laughs> Def Leppard. I've really been listening a lot lately on the radio to the Eagles, you know, <laughs> for some reason. And I just, the, the, the masterful way that they tell stories, the writing that was going on with the Eagles was crazy. Like Joni Mitchell, I mean, I think that she's one of the most incredible writers, alongside with having this voice that was like oh, just epic. They have influenced me in the way that I tell stories, in the way that I write. They have influenced me in the depth of the things that I wish to talk about and address in my work. They've helped me to formulate ideas around love, around living a very authentic life. When I think about how I think about the way that I present myself in the world, the way that I dress, the way that I approach the idea of style, that's definitely like coming from a lot of the musicians that I love. There's so many ways I think that, that, that musicians have affected the way that I think. My teaching at this point in my career fuels my artwork. You know, many years I kind of kept teaching at an arm's distance or at a half arm's distance because I was concerned that 
are we investing too much time and energy into the cultivating of other voices and not necessarily feeding my own work? As I get older, that's becoming less of an issue for me. What I found, I would say, is particularly over the past two semesters here, is that what I call the risk-taking, the fearlessness, the courageousness of my students is inspiring me to be risk-taking, courageous, and thoughtful in my own work. You know, I can't say, hey, try to write this form that you've never written in before, this genre that you've never written in before, and not try it myself. Do I plan to retire teaching to focus on my work? Well, I'm not sure that I actually can retire teaching. You know, ideally, I would like to say, sure, but I think that teaching is always going to be a part of my life. You know, whether or not I'm teaching for an institution is up in the air. But I feel like it's kind of in my genealogy and in my spirit to share information and to you know, make this information exchange with other human beings. And so I probably will never retire from teaching. I think there's times that all artists have, all writers have, where you're not comparing maybe your work to, the, to other folks around you, to your contemporaries and your colleagues, but you might be looking at where they are in their career professionally and wonder why you're not, you know, in that same space. Whenever those feelings kind of erupt in me where I'm doing that kind of why not me, quote unquote, shit, I'm like, because it's not your time. It's their time. And that's good because them getting the attention that they deserve for their work is only fueling you to work harder and to do the work that you're supposed to do in the world if that's supposed to be something that you're supposed to get, then eventually it will come to you. I try not to do too much of that kind of looking at other people's whatever and wanting that. That's, that's dangerous because then you're not focusing on what it is that you're really supposed to be doing in the world. You're worried about what somebody else is doing and you want to have that. And that's, at the end of the day, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> It's stalkerish. I want to keep producing. I want to continue to grow as an artist. I want to continue to grow as a thinker, as a writer. I want to continue to surprise myself, break boundaries. At the end of it all, I hope to leave a legacy. When I'm dead and ashes in the ground, I hope to leave behind a map, a breadcrumb trail, a series of documents. Uh, whether they be visual or whether they be written, whether they be interviews, other people don't be, that helps somebody else after me. And in hopes that it will generate even more magnificence from the world. That's what I hope.